Well, hi everyone. My name is uh, is Greg Short. I'm one of the co-founders of EDAR. I think the unique thing about EDAR is that unlike uh, traditional research firms that went and did things with consumer-oriented panel survey, we actually defined a taxonomy of video games that represents more than 15,000 unique aspects. Everything from camera angles, art styles, use of licenses, IPs, all that stuff. So at this point, we've got over 10 million facts in our own proprietary database. Uh, and then we integrate all that data with, uh, with numerous other sources, sales, data reviews, scores, uh, awareness, etc. So today we're going to talk about three titles, uh, Resident Evil 5, uh, UFC 2009, and Call of Duty World at War. Uh, this chart represents the growth between the introduction of new IPs versus licensed or existing IPs uh, in the market over the last few years. And one of the things that I think is really interesting here is the fact that, you know, obviously you would expect that, you know, once a game does well, we're going to release lots of sequels for it, you know, invest all this money building new IPs. Uh, we want to monetize them. But we're seeing a real acceleration of that. And I think, once again, that's been largely driven by uh, the introduction of the, the Wii and the DS and this amazing attempt to reach out to mainstream consumers. And because, you know, people have sort of been, well, they're not core gamers, how do we reach them? We've seen a lot of licensed games from Hannah Montana to Barbie to, you know, you name it. Okay, so on to RE5. We learned a lot about RE5 this morning. Um, but here's sort of a slightly different take on, on some stats that, that some people may not be aware of. Uh, one of the things that I think was really interesting, and, and uh, Chris and, and Mike didn't really hit this morning, was that so far this year, Resident Evil 5 has been the most watched game on game trailers uh, by far. And Capcom also got number two with, uh, with Street Fighter 4. So it goes to show that they are doing something right there in the way that they're getting people aware of these videos and making sure that there's really an easy path to, to get to the website. And uh, similar to the YouTube story, I mean, Game Trailers has the same stuff. It's getting embedded, it's getting virally distributed. Uh, people are getting excited about talking about uh, these trailers. And what it really did was, you know, yes, RE4 did well, but it was, it was a while ago when RE4 came out. Uh, and they were really able to revitalize this brand. One of the things that is interesting is uh, the direct marketing spend. Uh, we still see, on average, that the marketing spend for games is around the $3 million mark. And, you know, as an outside analyst who has no interest in marketing spends, uh, I can tell you that I really think the industry needs to spend more on marketing. Uh, if you look at Hollywood uh, and how much they spend on a percentage basis, it's much higher. Uh, these are huge investments, 15, 20 million, 30 million dollar investments on games. And then we trip over the wire with a $3 million spend. Um, I'm sure that most of you would love to have bigger budgets. Uh, so here's some interesting things about RE5. So what we're looking at here uh, is the marketing budget for the different RE5 games that have come out uh, and how that correlated to sales uh, in terms of their average life to date uh, and their average three months. And what you can see here, which is interesting, is that on the average three month sales, uh, there's a, a larger correlation on the end of it, it moves sales forward in that first three month period. But over the long term, um, it's a little bit flatter. You know, some of the games that had a little bit lower marketing budgets still sold pretty well, uh, you know, in terms of lifetime spends, uh, lifetime sales. So what you're really seeing here is that the bigger marketing budgets will help definitely drive your sales faster. They'll accelerate the, the sell through. So I think we were all a little bit surprised by how well UFC jumped out of the gates this year. I know THQ was very pleasantly surprised. Um, you know, there were a few factors that I think really contributed to why UFC did so well this year. I think some of the key points are that UFC has grown enormously as a brand over the last 24, 36 months. It's kind of become the modern day adult wrestling type game, you know, a little bit more bloody, a little bit more violent. Uh, and I think it's taken some market share away from boxing as well. Um, but in addition to that, the last title was released back in 2004. And this is actually a really interesting thing. We've done a lot of research recently on how do we relaunch a game. You know, we had this game franchise, and the last time we did it was back in 2003 or 2004. We're considering relaunching it. Is there a market to bring something out when we haven't had anything in the field for quite some time? I think Street Fighter IV is another great example. Um, absolutely, you can. I think it's a question of really understanding the brand and how it's changed over that time, not necessarily trying just to target that core consumer, but, but reaching out a little bit broader. 
And then I think also uh, USC had a great marketing campaign uh, in terms of integrating it and making it kind of really feel like you could live the life of being a fighter. And, and I think one of the things we often forget with marketing and reaching out to consumers is, you know, it, this isn't entertainment. This is uh, a fantasy world that we're letting these people come and play in for 20 or 40 hours or however long they play. And, you know, I, I think a lot of the marketing campaigns we're seeing, uh, even with the viral videos, I mean, it, this blending of real people with video games and making them sort of have more seamless integration is interesting. So, so these are the titles of UFC back in 2002 through 2004, and you can see that sales were pretty flat. Um, this is a, a per skew uh, representation. Now, the, the two that came out in 2009 for the 360 and the PS3, you can see the sales are just way up. So I don't know how, how many of you actually watched Spike, but uh, between all the major UFC games uh, that they were televising, in between the rounds, that would be the first ad that would come on. So you'd be watching this really intense, really exciting fight, and then you'd go straight into a scene where it was an entertainment experience with the game. And they ran a, a really great marketing campaign, and I think that uh, you know, really hit onto the strength of the UFC franchise. What's interesting, when we talk about trailer views, is where they were doing research. This is the Google Trends um, you know, report. And what this basically looks at is the percentage above average in searches that it, that game received. And you can see that by the time the game came out, uh, interest in searching for this title had risen eight times. So, you know, they were definitely doing the right thing, but these people were seeing it on TV, going on to Google, trying to learn more about what the game is, and then from there they were making purchasing decisions. So on to the last one, Call of Duty World at War. Wouldn't we all like to have that as a brand? So today I'm going to talk mainly about the DLC side of it because um, you know, obviously DLC is one of those big black holes that we're all kind of still working our way through. I and mean, we get access to see a lot of companies' different performances. Um, these ones are uh, what has been publicly announced uh, by Activision in relation to their DLC performance. And I think what's really interesting when you look at DLC is how much money you know, a good game can actually make with it. We're talking here the equivalent of an additional million units in net revenue to Activision that they've achieved through DLC. This is the sales curve uh, for Call of Duty. You can see it definitely had a very big first few months, uh, and then it kind of petered off. Uh, still not as steep on that long tail as what you would see from a lot of other titles, uh, you know, in terms of the average. But look how long it took before they first had their first map pack come out. It was really quite a ways out there. And uh, whether that was a strategic standpoint or, or whether it was just not ready in time, um, I've never actually asked Activision, I should probably do that at some point. Um, but, you know, it, one of the interesting things is you can imagine that if the second map pack here, which sold 3 million units, was available a little bit earlier in that curve, uh, that the sales would have been a lot stronger. Because by this point, a lot of them have been traded in for other games, or they have been, you know, handed off or put on the shelf for some other game that's come out. So you have to be ready to execute um, and, and get that stuff out. And of course, uh, map pack 2 came out uh, in June. Uh, and then the third map pack just came out very recently. Um, so the attach rates are pretty good, uh, even, even at the timing that they're looking at, at coming out. And I think that uh, certainly what we're seeing now is all of these people that have been playing Call of Duty all year long are going to turn around and transition straight into Modern Warfare 2. So it's been a way to keep their consumers engaged. Uh, it's been a way to provide ongoing commitment to showing that there is a loyalty to the game and to the franchise, and then that'll be re-monetized directly through this year's uh, release. And for anyone who's running, even if it's an 18-month or a 24-month cycle between your franchise releases, there's no reason you can't come up with an effective DLC strategy that's going to enable you to keep those players engaged uh, and work toward monetizing them effectively on your next release. So what does it all mean? Well, it means that Call of Duty is doing great. Um, you know, just growing and growing as a franchise. It's keeping momentum. Uh, we've seen good DLC strategies, even from uh, Modern Warfare uh, through to World at War. They're getting better and better at executing it, and I think that uh, you know, that's a, one of the reasons why it's such a threat, and you're seeing so many games moving away from them uh, this holiday season, trying to give them space to, to blossom. But of course, you know, if they come out with the right DLC strategy in Q1, then maybe there's not as much of a safe haven there as, as people are thinking. So.